You're listening to Your World Today on Radio Islam International. Now we cross over to the United Kingdom and we speak to Zishan Ali, the smile to Jannah guy who speaks to us live from London. Zishan, assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Wa alaikum assalam wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Can you hear me? Yes, loud and clear. Alhamdulillah. Good to have you with us uh, on uh, the program. Wow. She's so famous. <laughs> <laughs> Alhamdulillah, you are already a famous personality across South Africa with your videos, and we'll talk about that. But before getting to that, uh, Zishan, yes. uh, we want you to talk to us about the latest developments with regards to Tommy Robertson. Why is he again in the headlines? Do you say Tommy Robertson or Tommy Robinson? Yes. <laughs> Robertson or Robinson? Robinson. <laughs> I thought, who's this Tommy Robinson guy? I thought he was his brother or something. Um, well, it's you've asked a very good question. It's, I, I guess the short answer, the funny answer would be because he's a clown who has a big following. But the real answer is, I mean, if, if we're honest, it's because news stations like drama. They like controversy. They like distractions. Yeah? pulling us away from the pertinent issues because that's where their funding comes from. I mean, they're not going to talk about fake GMO, GMO foods because they don't want to expose such organizations because it doesn't meet their agendas. They're not going to talk about banking crimes, like banking loaning money that they don't have, artificial money printing, repressing interest rates. They're not going to talk about withdrawal of health and education rights. I mean, in the UK, well, I mean, when I was in university, each year I was in university, it cost me £3,000. Yeah? Now, that, that's all right. It's not that bad. But now, each year costs £9,000. So at oh. the end of your three years degree, that's £27,000 in the UK for a child to go to university. Now... In an age and an era in which education is regarded key and we're regarded as civilized, why on earth is a child paying £27,000? Yeah, that's the main question. Why is it that 80% of our MPs are coming from elite schools like Eton when someone, a regular person like myself, would have to pay £12,000 per year? Why is this the case? I mean, these are pertinent questions. I mean, why are our security systems being hacked by countries that we claim to be our allies? So, in short, Tommy is a good distraction. He fits the narrative of fake, non-relevant news. He is not the problem. The system that gives him the voice is. But hey, to the viewers, let's carry on watching TV and hating the Volvies. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, looking at the book, what does it contain? Uh, we understand that it's been discredited by Muslims and non-Muslims alike. Yeah. I mean, yeah. the, the thing is, obviously Muslims will, will, will discredit the book. I mean, they'll discredit whatever Tommy Robinson says. But, I mean, if I'm, if I'm being honest, yeah, the average layperson doesn't truly know why they don't like Tommy. It's because we're too busy earning and not learning. So if someone was to confront them with Tommy's accusations, I guarantee they won't be able to give convincing answers. Because unless we educate ourselves and practice our deen, yeah, we're going to create more Tommies. Because when they look around at Islam, they see people that are not practicing. Obviously, the non-Muslims, if you, I mean, I'm not going to sit here and tell you that, oh, no one likes Tommy. People do. His first book, en Enemy of the State, was a bestseller on Amazon. Yeah, it went to number one. This book as well is also a, well, it's going up in the bestsellers list as well. Now, why? Why is it that people are buying his book? They are scared. They're frightened. And who can blame them? Because the media thrives over scapegoats and drama. We only need to look at our history. I mean, who was hated before us? The black community. Before them, the communists. Before them, the Jews. Before them, the Japs. There always has to be a group that we must hate. And because of that fear that is generating, the unassuming gets attracted to the most clearest voice. 
because, I mean, the politicians can't give a single clear answer. I mean, if you were, uh, if you were to ask them what they had for breakfast, I mean, they wouldn't be able to give you a clear answer. So they go to the one who gives them quick solutions. I mean, let's face it, we live in an era of fast-acting medicine, fast food, fast deliveries, fast cars. So, <laughs> I mean, it's not really a surprise that people are turning towards tummy. But it's only when the average Muslim takes on board this responsibility, then, inshallah, Tommy's voice will be reduced, and hopefully then less people will be listening to him. Certainly we hope that in the serious questions that you do put forth in terms of uh, the entire mindset behind this. But just one or two more issues with regards to this book and uh, how it's been received. We understand that he was seen running away from Muslim guys in Portsmouth recently, he even fell down and was ridiculed on social media. Where does his hate for Islam come from? Uh, short answer, his childhood. Um, he was around Asians who didn't practice their deen properly. Their actions were questionable and he couldn't really attack them for their race because then he'd be called a racist. And of course, this country's been through a lot when it comes to curbing racism. Yeah, I mean, overt racism. I mean, institutional racism still exists. So obviously, he do choose the second best thing, which is their religion. Because let's face it, I mean, anyone can say anything against Islam nowadays, and it's just called freedom of speech. There's no real consequence. I mean, people still debate whether Islamophobia, the term, is valid or not, when you've got terms like anti-Semitism, which is cemented in our society. He was then, obviously, uh, suppressed by the police, which further fueled his hate. He was then attacked by certain emotional Muslims. I mean, when you look at Britain, Britain's first and Tommy, it's Muslims that don't know their deen, that just resort to emotional reaction, and then that gets reported and recorded. And then, obviously, that gave him further support from far-right extremists. And now he is very hard-headed. And my proof for that is the BBC documentary that he done with Mo Ansar, where he meets many scholars, average Muslims, and he dis- whenever they give a reasonable mainstream opinion of, opinion of Islam, he says he disregards them, and he says they are not the majority. And I would definitely say he has an irrational phobia of Islam. He mixes truth with falsehood, like we mix, mix um, you know, something sweet with bitter medicines for our children, so they can swallow it. So it's the same with the public. Yeah, if there's enough truth. You can add falsehood to it, and people will take that falsehood as truth. And that's literally what's, what's happening. And, uh, yeah, that's, that's Tommy for you. <laughs> now, now, Zishan, you've been doing well with your Smile to Jannah videos. What is the main inspiration for your work? Uh, life. <laughs> Everything that happens around me, I guess. My mistakes and the mistakes of others that I don't want my viewers to fall victim to. Uh, I mean, if you look at forces, you look at big brands and the movies that we see, no matter who they are, they all seek inspiration from their own experiences and their own surroundings. So I guess I'm a victim to that as well. (laughs) Uh, Which videos have done the best from your series and what do you believe the reason uh, has been behind their popularity? Uh, Previously, I guess the videos that I titled Types of types of people. For example, you've got types of salams, types of hugs, because they're light-hearted. Uh, people can, it's, it's a light-hearted way that people can learn about Islam. It's easily digestible and it's not too straining for them. Um, I mean, nowadays when people associate, um, you know, knowledge and Islam, they, they picture, you know, a Molvi with a big beard and with a stick in his hand or whatever, even though that's a traditional image, but uh, it's sadly the, the image that people still hold in, in their minds. And I guess recently, um, responding to the attacks of people against Islam, I guess, because people genuinely aren't seeing uh, much presence on social media by Muslims uh, tackling these issues in a light-hearted way, uh, which is, I mean, for the average person, I mean, the only knowledge that's accessible to them is through social media. I mean, we can give long lectures and masajids and uh, maktabs, but bottom line is that majority of the population is on social media. And if you were to just go on YouTube, you'd only see brothers like myself and Ali Dawa. And, I mean, 
there are a few brothers, but when you whittle it down to people that don't use music, that don't use bihayai and immodesty, it whittles down to only a few people. You've got Muhammad Hijab, Ali Dawa, myself, and then we're struggling for names, to be honest. So I guess people like the fact that they can both find someone that's approachable and we can uh, tackle pertinent issues as well. Uh, we've seen you've tackled depression uh, uh, recently, uh, the topic of depression. Will you be tackling more serious topics now? Or is lighter-hearted discussions the best way to get the message across? Uh, very good question. A uh, bit of both, I think, because comedy definitely transcends languages and cultures. It's definitely an underrated, valuable tool for conveying vital truths to people. I mean, I can give you names, uh, secular names, like George Carlin, you've got Bill Hicks. These people were known to, you know, they had a big audience and they were known to, you know, tackle pertinent, pertinent issues. Recently, you've got Muslims like Amir Rahman of Australia, you've got Azhar Usman, who's a famous Muslim comedian. But then if you look at mainstream, you've got people like Dave Chappelle, but also you've got people like Frankie Boyer. I mean, he's moved very towards the left. And now when he started talking about these issues, he's been sidelined by mainstream media. So just like human behavior, we can't be too serious and can't be too laid back either. I mean, we need, we need, uh, we need a balance. So I guess the same balance needs to come uh, from Smart Agenda as well. The, the content, I guess, should reflect the needs of the people with an undertone uh, of comedy. Uh, keep up with the great work, Zishan. Your work is appreciated <laughs> in South Africa. Many, many people do appreciate it and uh, take lots of inspiration from it. And we certainly hope that exactly. you'll visit South Africa someday and, you know, go around and meet people and <laughs> uh, get the feedback from them on the ground, inshallah. Inshallah. Jazakallah khair for having me. And, uh, yeah, I'll, uh, I'll try to visit you guys, inshallah.